I've got a few handouts. I'll start them around. The presentation will be posted on the Diverse Ag website. I'm going to talk about uh, food safety and direct marketing, a little bit on the food safety, new food safety act, and if we have time, the good ag practices program. These are some typical direct marketing outlets that you're probably familiar with and have worked with. If we look for just a minute at why food safety is important, um, there's these three trends. People are, are eating more away from home. There have been a lot of food safety incidents that have received attention, so people are more aware of it. There's also fewer farmers, so there's less of a connection with the grower. If we look, there's over 200 diseases transmitted through food. The Center for Disease Control estimates 48 million illnesses, 128,000 hospitalizations, 3,000 deaths from food in general. And what I'm going to be talking mostly about is produce. So if we look at just produce, um, they went through their estimates from 96 to 2010, so that's a pretty long time period. 131 incidents, 14,000 illnesses, hospitalizations, 34 deaths. So this is a concern. And over these incidents, there were 20 different types of produce that were involved. So food safety, having a good food safety plan can have a lot of benefits. It may enable you to charge a higher price. And people in general, are sometimes willing to pay a higher price for some, some of these perceived benefits. So local food, nutrition, other factors. If we look at some of the risks, they're listed here, biological, chemical, and physical. Here's some of the biological risks. So bacteria, viruses, and also allergens. We look at chemical and physical, this could be uh, maybe a pesticide product that was used, um, sticks and stones. There's a lot of options for uh, contamination or injury. If we look at the Food Safety Modernization Act, it requires new produce safety rules. And Farmers, growers, and food processors are going to have to be more involved in telling FDA what they're doing on their operation to keep their food safe. The focus of this is on prevention rather than a lot of recalls. One aspect of this may be FDA doing on-farm audits. The Food Safety Act also gives FDA more authority to conduct recalls before it was up to the person producing the food although FDA could encourage them this gives them the absolute authority on their own to do a recall the focus of the food safety act is on microbial contaminants and not some of the other chemical and physical items that we talked about okay the question was the food safety act versus gap GAP came out in 98, it's guidelines from FDA and USDA, but they're voluntary. These are required, the things we're gonna talk about are required. Um, I haven't been able to find out exactly what happens to all of your records, other than if you're audited, you may have to produce them, but we'll go in detail on the, the records that will be required. And there's different, if you're a certain size operation, the rules vary. So the focus of the Food Safety Act is these five items. Water, animal manure, health and hygiene of the workers, animals, and tools. So I want to look a little bit closer at these items in particular. The ag water is water that's going to contact produce that's going to be harvested. And it has to be sanitary. So one of the requirements will be an inspection of the water system. So you may go walk along the canal, make sure that there's not dead animals somewhere in the system that comes to your farm. If the water is not safe, and they have some microbial standards, like for E. coli, 
or chemical, you may have to test the water to make sure that it's safe and keep records of your inspection, your tests, things like that. Animal manures, there's requirements for composting. There are certain microbial standards of allowable E. coli, salmonella, whatever, in the manure. There's also minimum application levels, waiting time 90 to 120 days, depending on the situation. There's a requirement for worker training in health and hygiene. It's just use of uh, uh, porta potties, hand washing, that workers are trained, that they're following the guidelines. All of these things on the Food Safety Act right now are suggested, and I'll go into the dates in a minute. It's open for comment until May, and once it's published, they're effective 60 days afterwards. So if there's things here that you have concern about, I'll show you the website. You could go in and, and make suggestions. Say, hey, this what you're proposing won't work. Now, you have to be a speed reader. The rules that I looked at are 600 pages, so it may take a while to find a little part that you don't think is reasonable for your operation. Okay, on composting, the standard is maintain 131 degrees for three days, or if you're turning 131 for 15 days and turned five times. This is just one example. On all of these other things we're talking about, there's little rules and guidelines like this. If you're using animals in the field, say if you're using draft animals, there's a recommendation, have a path for the animals, like a walkway, harvest walkway or whatever. Don't let them out into the produce that you're harvesting. Also, a requirement to monitor for wild animals. And obviously, if there's animal excretia on something you're planning to harvest, don't harvest that. I mean, a lot of this is just common sense. There's also a requirement that tools are kept clean, um, the equipment, bins that you're using are kept clean, and that you have a record of your pest control operations, that you've provided uh, hand washing toilet facilities. Okay, um, you can go to regulations.gov, or you can go to this other website, um, fda.gov food safety, and all of the proposed rules are right there that you can look at. Some of the things I've read about this, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, it may increase costs. There may be some conflict with organic regulations. I haven't been able to tell exactly what that might be other than several sources I've looked at mentioned this as a concern. It's open for comments until May 16th. Well, I think everyone should have some kind of food safety plan for their operation, no matter what size. And in a minute, we'll look at the different thresholds for these particular new regulations. For example, if you're under, I think, 25,000, you're exempt of gross income uh, past three years average. This is from the Food and Drug Administration, and they may also contract with the State Department of Ags in the different states. I haven't been able to read in the 600 pages who gets this information. Yes, in the back. Yeah, the regulations were due in 2012, and for whatever reason, they were delayed until January of 2013. I don't know their figures from the Centers for Disease Control, and, you know, there's a lot more foodborne problems with the really big numbers, and then I showed the smaller numbers, those were just from produce. But for example, there were problems with strawberries a few years ago, a couple of years ago there were problems with cantaloupe in Colorado, uh, spinach, so a lot of the big incidents that I'm aware of were U.S. grown produce. Now, if people are growing produce out of the country, and importing it to the U.S., they will be subject to these same regulations, and if they do not supply their records to FDA, they will not be allowed to import it. The exact details of the enforcement I'm not aware of. Seth, do you want to give us any insight? Right, there's exemptions if you're, if you're consuming it on the farm. Okay, let's, let's look at some of the exemptions. Um, just a quick word on traceability. 
Um, there's a lot of real elaborate systems, but some growers that I've worked with have developed their own system. This is what they have. The field, the crop, the harvest crew, the date it was harvested, who it was sold to, who bought it, and their name on the box. So this is a real simple way to start doing traceability and being able to keep track. Okay, the produce safety standards apply to fruits and vegetables in their raw or unprocessed farm form. And a farm is where you grow this stuff. There's also a definition of a mixed facility, which means that you're conducting some type of processing, or if you hold it for an extended time, there may be a requirement, for example, to monitor your cooler temperature that is kept at the right range. So um, if you're doing processing, then there's a requirement to register with FDA. But if you're just doing harvesting, trimming, or washing, then you can be exempt from the facility registration. But if you're doing more than that, then you should register. Here again, there's a lot of questions about this. Some people said, if, if in doubt, register and then unregister, and others are saying to wait and see until it's clarified. But if you register as a food processor, then there's a whole other set of rules like sanitation, clean equipment, uh, monitoring temperatures, things like that. Okay, as part of the Food Safety Act, there's an amendment that if you, your sales are under 500,000, you may be exempt from Part of this is FDA is looking at the broad scope, Big process or big growers that ship over wide area, more chance of spreading disease if there's a problem. And as this lady mentioned, if you're exempt, there may still be state and local requirements you have to comply. Okay, part of the exemption is if you're selling directly to consumers or restaurants in the same state or 275 miles from your operation and the direct sales are more than 50% of your sales, then you can be exempt. Another part of this is that your boxes or containers have to be labeled with the name and address of your operation. Part of this goes back to traceability. There's a problem they want to be able to know where the problem might have come from so they can help solve it. Some other things are exempt. For example, produce that's normally not consumed raw. Now I like to eat raw potatoes so it might still apply, but potatoes are an example. Or if you're growing green beans that are gonna be processed, then you may not be subject to some of these things. Okay, it's effective 60 days after the final rule. If you gross less than 25,000, then you'll have four years to meet most of these requirements and six years on the water. And then you can see different levels there's going to be a grace time. FDA's goal is to do a lot of education before they come in with the heavy regulations. And I'll give you some resources on, on that in just a second. So there's some time to, to get used to doing this. Okay, we already talked about the registration as a food establishment. Okay, uh, the main resource for helping develop your uh, farm food safety plan that FDA is promoting is this Produce Safety Alliance. It's at Corn Cornell University. They have a mandate to develop an example plan, training materials for your workers. And so you can go there. They have their curriculum already as to what they understand right now. You can print that out on, on worker training, record keeping, those kind of things. Okay, any questions right now on the Food Safety Act? There's a lot of unknowns, but the bottom line is FDA wants more record keeping as to what you're doing to keep produce safe. Yes. No, if you're under the 500,000 and you're selling more than half of your crop, direct marketing to consumers or restaurants, in my understanding is, that's if you're uh, selling less than 50% direct market or selling more than 275 miles away. So like the people with their peaches, 
organic peaches and they're taken to Seattle, I don't know how far away they were. If they're more than 275 miles, then they would be. Okay, um, now we're gonna talk just a little bit about GAP, Good Agricultural Practices. This is the voluntary program and there's other types of programs like the Leafy Green Marketing Agreement. GAP is a voluntary certification program, covers a lot of the same things. There's a checklist, there's an auditor, you have to pay them to come in and be certified. They're going to be updating their GAP guidelines, but this is what was there before. But the value of GAP is, for example, if you're growing larger amounts, like Walmart, you have to be GAP certified. That means you go through all this record keeping on the hazards, what you're doing, and then an auditor comes in, looks at your books and records, and gives you a certification. Now this is just a one day visit. It doesn't eliminate any problems. For example, the, the cantaloupe problem in Colorado, they had just passed their GAP certification. But these are some problems that showed up in the investigation after the problem. So um, listeria was the pathogen, but it was not found in the field. They think it showed up in the packing shed. They were using a truck to haul the coals out to some cattle. Listeria is common in manure, so one theory was they picked up manure in the truck, brought the truck back into their shed. Um, their equipment was hard to sanitize and the listeria got into their cantaloupe and caused some real problems. Right, so a lot of supermarkets are requiring it. Selling to schools, you need to be GAP certified. So this is what they did in Colorado. They put in a new packing shed. Um, their trucks only carry their products. They have a tracking code and worker training. Anyone that grows Rocky Ford melons has to go through this shed that has all the latest, greatest stuff. And so they feel like they've, they've uh, really minimized the hazard. They will skip through this. So there's a lot of different companies that can do a gap audit. You need a score of 80% to pass, and it covers all of these different areas, water, chemicals, worker training, things like that. And uh, same things that we've talked about, water, sewage, livestock, uh, manure use, uh, soil maps, field sanitation, transportation. A lot of grocery chains are international, so they'll only accept a program called Global Gap, which is internationally accepted. They will not accept USDA Gap. There's efforts in the produce industry to kind of bring all of these programs together, and this is the goal. One audit, third party, acceptable to all buyers. And you can look at some of the GAP standards worksheets here at um, United Fresh. It's about 30 or 40 pages with all of the different criteria that, that they'd like you to meet. Part of the harmonized effort is they're looking also at pesticide use a little bit closer than some of the Washington State here on their website they have some great information on helping set up a farm <coughs> safety plan we've talked about the produce safety alliance that's another good resource there's a lot of different groups working in this area this global food safety initiative is kind of a group that sets the standards run and set up by European supermarkets. Then Global Gap is a particular standard that meets their criteria. So then we're down to another level. These are some certifying agencies. So these are the people that would actually come out to your farm and do the audit. So we have this big global group that kind of sets the standards, then another one that kind of puts in the details, and then we have the auditors that actually come out and say yes, so I think the bottom line is, start thinking about a farm food safety plan, be aware of the new regulations, how they might affect you, and um, if you want to sell to certain places, the global gap or gap might be required, like a lot of supermarkets, a school lunch program. Um, if you're under the 500,000 limit and you're selling over half direct marketed, 
then my understanding in right now is that she would be exempt. But just for your own protection and your customers, you would want to have some of these components, like records of chemical use, and if you have workers that they've been trained and you've provided uh, hand washing facilities, things like that. So just some very simple steps, you know, would go a long ways. If there was ever a question or problem, you could say, yep, this is what I've done. Like I say, I don't know right now, other than if there was a problem and you were audited and you were subject to this, then you would have to supply the record. But I, I don't think it's like, um, from your description, it, I wouldn't want to eat it, so it would probably, it's, this is designed for produce that's consumed. Okay, any other questions? I'm sorry I don't have a lot of answers. There's a lot of unknowns. Like I say, there's a lot of proposals out there. Once they're approved and go into effect, then we'll be subject to them. I passed around some copies, and uh, it'll be on the Diverse Ag website. 